I believe the real response to climate change is to create buildings that can heal the environment. When we currently think about this in architecture, we focus on reducing carbon dioxide emissions. In other words, recycling materials, using more efficient technologies, and linking our buildings up to alternative energy systems. What we're trying to achieve is a carbon zero building, one which, when it's up and running, that does not produce any net carbon dioxide emissions. Here's an example, the Green Lighthouse in Copenhagen. Now, what this building and other buildings like it do not achieve is to address the relationship at the heart of building practice, namely that making a building has a negative impact on the environment. And this is really important because carbon zero policies only slow this down. And there are plenty of other things happening in the built environment that are speeding the whole process up. For example, in the next 40 years, we'll see another 2 billion people on the planet. 70% of them will be living in cities and will have to build homes for them. So unless we change this relationship from a negative to a positive one, then our building industry is set to have a huge negative effect on the health of the planet. But how might we do this? Last year, I gave a presentation about how it may be possible to create a building and grow it using a new technology called a protocell. This is a chemically programmable agent based on the chemistry of oil and water. And at the time, it was just a concept. But now, we've started to engineer the technology, and I can show you a protocell building a solid tube of crystalline material. Now, I just want to make sure you know what you're looking at, because it's wonderful. In the center of the picture is the protocell. It works by energy at the oil-water interface, and that's around the edge of the droplet. In real life, this is all just about visible with a naked eye. The protocell has an internal chemical program, and it compares this with what's happening in the chemistry and the environment. And the output is to create this awesome tube of crystalline material. Now, all of this happens without any DNA. No DNA. This means this is not alive. And yet, this process is incredibly biological. It's reminiscent of the way that tube worms or corals might secrete their shells. And because at the heart of the protocell is a general chemical program, we can change it. We can engineer it to create different kinds of materials. So here's another one that can produce a limestone-like substance from dissolved carbon dioxide. Now we have a technology that can make a solid material with biological-like properties. What could we do with that? We've been making a paint for the surfaces of buildings using this protocell technology to create um, an interface between our buildings and the environment for carbon capture and storage by literally growing a limestone coat around it. Now, this doesn't require us to make great buildings. This requires us to create a transformation of existing building stock. And of course, that's cited exactly where our pollutions and emissions are actually being produced. And although this technology is at its early stage of development, it's already showing us a whole new set of tools and technologies that may be available for us to create buildings differently. But more importantly, it gives us an opportunity to change this relationship at the heart of building practice. And it's time to think beyond carbon zero policies and create carbon negative architectures ones that in the processes and the materials of their construction actually remove carbon dioxide and perhaps other substances from the environment. And all the results that we've had in the laboratory suggest this is possible. Thank you.
electric grid was conceived in the age of Edison, designed in the age of Eisenhower, installed in the age of Nixon, and it has not been upgraded since. It's just not able to keep up with modern needs. Well, the notion of the smart grid is using what we have better, making do with what we've got and not build so much new infrastructure. Software at the gateway between generation and transmission can solve that problem. The smart grid is actually a bunch of smart devices connected over a network to a bunch of computers. And the computers crunch all this data and then are able to optimize the system. What we're working on is helping utilities see what's actually happening in real time in terms of the flow of electricity between all those devices. Benefits the consumers, benefits the environment, all because of things we can now see that we couldn't see before. On the Olympic Peninsula, p &L's goal was to make the smart grid tangible. We were taking home area networks as a way of sending messages to the homes and to the devices in the homes about when they should run or not run. There was one other modem here that captured wirelessly the reports from the different elements. We saved approximately during this time 15% of our electric bill. If we can do that for everybody in the country, we're talking about saving $100 billion worth of infrastructure that we won't need to build. IBM has been the first big company to really see the opportunity to marry information technology with the grid. There are similar things going on in South America, Asia, in Europe. We've been working with Malta to make both the water and electricity systems much more efficient. It is a model for how we can then bring that to other other larger geographic areas. The path forward to a smart grid is actually quite clear. We upgraded our telecommunications networks, our satellite networks, and we can do the exact same thing uh, with a smart grid. A wind plant will go up and down by the minute. A solar plant will go up and down as clouds go over. So having a grid that can flex itself and manage these, these kinds of things is critical. We need to be planning for the kind of future that we say we want, which is an era of cheap, reliable, clean electricity for decades to come.